Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. Hello, welcome to Impact the World, where my guest today is the wonderful Ricky Byers. I'm a huge fan of Ricky's music and her energy too, having got to see her live. And so it was a real treat to get this conversation with her today. Ricky is a, a, a really lovely blend of creating work designed to inspire, uplift and enhance people's lives but also someone who for several decades has been very involved in activism in the world. And I really love that she bridges both in her life, in her way of being and what she stands for. So I hope you enjoy getting to meet Ricky if you're new to her work or hearing a little bit more about her story if you're familiar with her work. I highly recommend her albums. I highly recommend her YouTube lives. You can find everything about Ricky at rickybyers.org. And as usual, we will put notes in the show notes so that you can click through to the links. And if you are a fan of Impact the World, we are a fully independent show. So it really supports us if you are watching on YouTube, if you can subscribe to the channel, and if you are listening over on Apple Podcasts, if you can subscribe, rate or review, it helps us reach more listeners with what we're doing over here. For today, I hope you enjoy getting to meet Ricky Byers. Ricky, thank you so much for being here today at Impact the World. It is beautiful to meet you in person, even though I have been in the room with you before when I was brought to Agape a few, about three years ago now, and it was my first time at Agape. Uh, my husband, Stephen, who had been many times, was excited to bring me. And I loved the atmosphere there. Um, it was great. I'd seen Michael uh, Michael Bernard Beckwith on, on video a few times. So it was nice to see the electricity he has as a speaker and, and all of that in the room. And then you came on stage. In fact, maybe you were there from the beginning, but you started doing the music. Mm -hmm. And then I had a spiritual experience. So thank you so much, because what you what you and your and the people that were your musicians and singers that day it was really phenomenal and that that really uh, just lit me up and i went and got your um in the land of i am cd and i would have that in the car as i was driving around and so so i i was deeply touched by your gift firsthand and your ability to conduct through the body with your music with your voice and and also the way that you were leading the choir so Deep bow and thank you for being here. Hey, thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. And I'm glad you got in when you did, because this November, I this November I celebrate uh, three years away, stepping from Agape. Ah, oh, wow. Okay. So I did just get in in time. Yeah, you got in in time. Yeah. And if I, if I remember rightly, I, I heard a story that you didn't initially want to go and, and work at Agape. You were invited back at the beginning by Michael, but you, you kind of said no, and you had some skepticism. If you don't mind, because I found that so interesting. Well, oh, I have skepticism about most of everything, <laughs> nature. <laughs> except nature. You know, nature is pretty clear and transparent. But uh, when I got the invitation to sing at Agape, um, I just, my daughter had been through a very serious healing crisis. She was just three years old. And, um, and the minister, I was playing at a church. Um, I, I, when I came to LA from New York City, I'm from the South, but I went to New York City and I did well there as an artist. And then I had a hit record. And then with that money, we moved to uh, Los Angeles, my husband and I my second husband, and who was a musician. And, um, and so now I'm four years into a marriage, five years into a marriage, and it's just really hard. And we have two children, mm. little children. And uh, so my daughter had gotten so sick and I'd gone to the minister of that church that I was singing for um, on Sundays. I didn't, I wasn't a member of the church. I was just working as an artist there, like lots of artists do. And he, 
Um, but he had a certain amount of wisdom that I respected, you know. And so I went and I asked him a question about her, about my daughter, uh, because my daughter was not in a comatose state, but her body was. And she couldn't see and uh, she couldn't move and she could barely talk at this point. Uh, my daughter's a genius and now she's 37 and tonight she's opening at the Blue Note. <laughs> Oh, wow. And, and tomorrow night, she'll be there, too. She'll be there for two nights. The only act. She's extraordinary. She was at the Hollywood Bowl last weekend. So she, she went on to do well. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, all great masters have to go through their austerities and the things that they must bear in order to stand really strong in, in the power of who they are. And I know, this is what I feel. And um, I asked this minister of this church that I was playing for at the time, um, what would, you know, could he give me some wisdom about, could he, could he direct me? Like, I just didn't know what was happening. And I was like 35 years old and just wondering what's going on. I'm, you know, just all this fear. And he said, it's, he said, it's, it, it's God's will for her to be blind. And I couldn't accept that. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hear anything about God's will for her to be anything but but perfect and restored, mm-hmm. you know, and so when he said he said it could it it's, it's it looks like it's God's will for her to be blind. I was like, no, I didn't tell him that, but inside I'm going like, Mm-mm. no, that's wrong answer. <laughs> so uh, I, needless to say, but, well, but my daughter healed, and and I saw that it was not really it was about me. She was just showing me some things about myself. So. When I got the call from Michael to sing at the church, I was like, I, I, I absolutely didn't want to sing at any more New Thought churches, you know. And I had some words about ministers of New Thought churches that weren't so kind, but I've since grown to feel in myself. <laughs> <laughs> but when, so when he called, I was not interested in, in coming to his church, but because he had heard a song that I sung, And the person who helped write that song with me told him she's not coming to the church. You know, she's skeptical. She's cynical. She's militant. She's mad. She ain't coming because he had had lunch with me to tell me about Michael. And I was like, not interested. (laughs) So when he when he called, Michael can be very persuasive. So and his his persuasion was to the tune of about ten dollars more than what I had been making at the other church. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> right. But I needed to work. I needed some money. We we needed money. And I went. And that's how I got to Agape. And when I stepped into Agape that Sunday I came, it, Agape had been around for a year. So I I stepped in on the what they call the Charter sun, Sunday. Mm. And so he must have thought highly of my talent to bring me in on a day like that. And uh it was it you know, it was extraordinary what happened for inside of me when I was around all that love, you know, n- n- not necessarily from him, but from the people. Yeah. You know, and then when I interacted with him, he was a very kind man. But when he spoke, it was, I could hear he knew. Mm. I knew he knew what he was talking about, you know, and um, he was amazing. Well, and I know you two had an in- incredible partnership for several decades, and it was interesting to me to witness this relay in the room when I was there. And 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 I'll speak for myself because it's different for everybody. For me, it was when you sang and when the music started that the love all kind of hit me, and I was like, "Whoa, this is great!" You know, and and I'm curious for you because you know reading some of your history in the last few days and looking into your career, you know, you are now known as one of, you're one of our most celebrated spiritual composers. And you've been working, creating these chants and devotional songs and inspirational songs for three decades. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it sounds like you were, you were more in contemporary music, perhaps you said you'd had a hit record. Yeah, I had, well, I had a, it was regional, like internationally, it was way more known than in America, though it was a huge hit in New York City during the disco days. And there's an artist named Shamise, and there's this song called She Can't Love You. And She Can't Love You is just the DJ's 
adore them. I mean, all the DJs know that song and they kept it alive. I mean, it's on all their mixes. It's played at the World Cup. DJ Snake uses it in his tags, you know, so it's like a, a very celebrated song. Um, uh, and But it's the only song that I ever wrote to make money. Like even even in those days in New York, I wasn't doing uh, the commercial, the regular commercial kind of stuff. I'd never written a song like that. I just got an invitation from somebody that had a studio that said, Ricky, you're nine months pregnant. You didn't marry me. So why don't you come in? I'm going to give you a gift. <laughs> I'm going to give you a gift of studio time. Just write a, write a dance record. They're giving away record deals these days. And this was in... Uh, 1982, and uh, he says they're giving away record deals. Just come and and just do it. You can do it with your eyes closed. You can write it in no time. You're a genius. You can do this. And I was like, ah, you know. <laughs> and so he said, and so when I'm hanging up the phone, he said, do it. You can do it. <laughs> and I hung up the phone. I took a breath, and I went to the piano, and I became, um, I I became a. Uh, uh, a person that was at the nightclub and she, she sees her man there with somebody else. And she says, well, I see you. I saw you at the club last night and I see who you were with too. But then she says, she can't love you like I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the name of the song is She Can't Love You. And the artist is Shamise and I'm Shamise. And uh, I did all the music and the person that was my husband, Ronald Muldrow, he did all the, all the instrumentals. So the two of us went in and do this and did this record. And on the, the day that my, my son was born, uh, May 19th, 1982, uh, the record deal was signed. <laughs> wow. In the hospital at Roosevelt Hospital. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, signing the record deal, you know, that I never, um, you know, that I never was able to get. Uh, that kind wow. of, you know, it's like a song about nothing. It took three minutes to write. And I have a whole devotional, inspirational catalog that uh, people are finding out about and that they love and that people carry in their hearts. But She Can't Love You is by far the most successful song on paper. And you say a three minute song and, you know, I, I you know, I, I know that you, you get those gifts of songs, right, where they just come through you, but they're, they're not often like a lot of the time you have to work or craft but you i guess had been working musically since you were how old like when did music when did music and you first begin this relationship that you have i've been with it all the time I yeah mean, like i remember even as a little kid being awakened by spirits and they're dancing and singing and i was in the tots choir at three years old singing i could pick out melodies on piano you know without music lessons and i'm largely like 90% self-taught. So um, except for one year of solid piano lessons, and that that was at 48, you know? Oh, <laughs> you know? Wow. So I just wanted to know if I could do it. And I, I did well with uh, private lessons, learning to read music. I can write out charts very well. but uh, and, and I learned to do that from different musicians. And then the man I married, uh, my second husband, uh, was a musician. So, mm. you know, we... We had some good old conversations about music, but I came out of the box in a funny kind of way. Uh, in my family, in the industry, and in the world, I'm not, in, I'm not identifying with the world. Mm. You know, my identity is, is, in, is with my heart. Mm. And you, to me, are one of those shamanic musicians. You know, some of the musicians that I really love when I see them play live, uh, or when I hear their compositions, there's a there's a shamanic signature to me where there is either a channeling element or a because I I think all music comes through that connection, but some people just take it wide. Like there's a there's a width and a, an energetic opening that you feel when you're in the room with someone like that. So for you, was spirituality and music at what point did spirituality become? a consciousness for you, perhaps either separate to the music or when, at what point did it all start to coalesce? Um, well, I was always writing about something deeper than I want to get my man back. Mm. You know, uh, my first songs were kind of like that. Uh, in, but I was 19. And by the time I hit 20, 21, I cared about the world and what was happening in the world. 
but I was newly married and I got married very quickly, very impetuously and just, you know, just too fast. Mm. But it was great because it taught me a lot. And those songs were about I need to be needed for who I am. You know, I got to find a way to be needed for, for what I am. You know, so th there was this search for, for meaning in life. My earlier songs were largely about that, you know. And then uh, when I met Ronald and we started writing and we had a hit record, then for the next four years, you know, it was like trying to recreate the hit. And, uh, and that was so boring. On the side, I was still writing on piano by myself. And those songs were about, um, still about love, but more than shallow love. Yeah. Just, still the yearning to be loved. Who will know, who will love me? Who will know how to begin to feel my heart? You know, were the songs that I was writing. And then when I stepped into agape, something else happened. What Right before agape, when I wrote that song, God is, Alive, God is Alive and Well, I didn't write it. I thought it was a corny topic. And when the person came to me and says, would you help me write this song at the church that I was working at before agape? Uh, I was like, I wanted to go like, mm-mm. <laughs> but I couldn't. <laughs> he was so nice. He was like, could you? I got these lyrics. And I'm thinking like, oh, God. So I did something <laughs> called a mercy write. You know, mercy write is like you write it even though it ain't your level, but mm -hmm. you're going to end up, you're going to. But so I started singing God is alive and well and. His words were, God is alive and well and living in the USA. He's alive and well and living in Russia, too. And, 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 you know, and he's got these words, right? And I'm thinking, like, how can I make this sound good? And I did. So when my daughter had her healing crisis, she wanted to hear only that song. Mm. And my mom says, that song is special. You need to record that song. That song is special, baby. Something, something about that song. She said, I like the song, but that baby only wanted to hear you sing that song. And because in the middle of it, it says it's, it is his power that heals when we kneel and pray. It's his power that changes the world every day. These are the words that this person had given me, you know, and, but I sang it with such sweetness to my daughter. She said, it's the only one that she wanted to hear. She couldn't even talk. And I was like, well, you want to hear it? Roll, roll, roll your boat. You're, mm, mm, mm. And then she, you know, because even then she was a genius. <laughs> you know, so, so then she was like, you know, so I said, God's love and well. And because I thought her, she grunted something and I'm thinking like, what is she saying? You know, so it's really looking for meaning there in that moment. Mm -hmm. So I found the way to really listen to what's being asked of me, mm -hmm. you know, and the music has absolutely revealed to me what I need to be doing. And that all the songs that I wrote before the spiritual um, alignment uh, more deeply, because I think it was all spiritual. I think growing up emotionally is as important as learning how to meditate. And I was learning, I was meditating while growing emotionally. You know, I'd been meditating be way before I came to Agape. You know, uh, and I've always been present with God inside of myself. So when it opened and it was like this love of something that is bigger than me, not just my pain and my emotion and my wanting and my needing, but something, when I realized that there was something greater really holding me, and that was there for me, and, and, and it was always there for me, uh, that's when the joy began to really erupt hmm. in my writing. So I hear people say this a lot about channeling, and I always kind of looked like, hmm, you know, because my thought of channeling was off. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I thought about it, you know, it was like, because I'm thinking like, I'm not channeling nothing. This is coming through me. You know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's coming through you. But it, it, it you know, but it's from God. Mm. You know, it's through you. And it's from 
you in the sense that it's your voice and, and it's your it's your you're you're setting the table for the meal that's that's prepared for you to be shared with the world. And I'm um Agape absolutely provided the space for me to sit and listen. Hmm. It's interesting you say that because I I you know I am a channeler. I have been for 23 years and I've been doing it publicly or for work, I guess, for 17 years as part of what I do. And it took me many years to to get to this place uh, of people asking me the question, well, when I'm channeling, how do I know I'm really channeling and I'm not just making it up? Mm -hmm. And I, my answer is always, well, you are making it up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's not real. But you're more involved than you want to believe you are. Because I think sometimes with channeling, there is this perception of, oh, I went into this trance and something took me over and I completely surrendered. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, you're still in co-creation. You're still uh, the vehicle through which it's coming. Your filters, your limits, your possibilities, your... So so it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel the same way with music. It's a, it's a co-created thing. And so it's interesting to hear you you reflect on that in that way too, in a way. Yeah, it, it, it was, thank you. And, um, and, th and then it was awesome because I was writing, like when I first wrote the first song that I wrote in Agape, well, I wrote another song. I just provided music though. I didn't do the lyrics with somebody that was at Agape that had a beautiful lyric and we wrote a beautiful song together. But it was when Michael asked me to, um, and we have become friends, like he, I hadn't started classes yet, I think, but uh, he was a great teacher at that time, really great. And uh, uh, he asked me to write a song for Thanksgiving. And I was like, oh, oh, that's corny. You know, it's like, it sounded like a work for hire. And I was never the person for work for hire. Mm. You know what I'm saying? When somebody hires you to do this specifically, yep. Yep. you know, it's kind of like, in the bag with the mercy writing. Yeah. You know, it's like I never was the person that I, I didn't, I just didn't do that well. I didn't think. And so he said, good. He says, he says, go, he says, yeah, uh, just, just write a song for Thanksgiving. I think he was probably remembering the story about write that dance record that you can make some money. You know, he says, why don't you write a song for Thanksgiving? I was like, no, uh, that's corny. I'm not doing that. Mm. <laughs> I don't care who you are. You could be the preacher or whatever. I'm going to tell you, that's a corny idea and I'm not doing it. So I was at home vacuuming and and this melody came and it was like, I thank you. You know, I'm, I'm vacuuming. Mm -hmm. I thank you. And it kept going. And then I went to the piano and it's like, doo -doo, doo -doo, you know, and it was just like, whoa, that's really nice. That's nice. But I didn't know how to say what I was thankful for. I probably could have if I sat long enough with it, but I knew who asked me to do it. And I knew he had a lot of words because, you know, Michael got yep. the words, right? Yep. And and in, the, in those days, I could hear his poetry even before he, you know, I could hear he was a poet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I called around until I found him. I said, I got this song coming through. Can you give me these lyrics? <laughs> and he says, well, well, wait a minute. Let me turn within for a moment. Let, let, wait a minute, let me turn within. And he said, I thank you. And this is, I'm saying this story because I'm thinking about what you said about it's all of you that channels through, that you're totally co-create, even in trance. Mm. It's using all of you, mm. you know, it, this powerful universe, this, in, this intelligence that's beyond, beyond, right? Mm. It's so present for us. So he says, I thank you for being so real and touching me and letting me see what a beautiful world this world is. And I'm writing like, this brother's bad. And, he, <laughs> and then he says, and I thank you for all that's revealed while you're changing me, opening my time-blinded eyes to see my glorious possibilities. And I'm just writing. I was like, this is bad. He said, that's good. That's good. I was like, yo, this is so good. You know, so I wrote it down. And uh, and then he gave me the second verse. Maybe it's true that some folks can't see. And so I said, okay, now I need to work on the middle part. You know, he says, well, I can work on it. 
So he bought food over. He bought some sandwiches. That's when I fell in love, even though I was married to somebody else. He bought the sandwiches over because when people bought me food, they got it. <laughs> I was a fat baby. <laughs> Mm. I was a, I, when I when I landed, I wanted food, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and people go like, "You were a fat baby." Like, mm. So anyway, he came over with the with the sandwiches, and we finished writing that song. And when I sang it at Agape, it was, it was it. That was mm. that was the beginning. Mm. And it's funny, isn't it? Because there's something so powerful about those simple lyrics sometimes. But I know my experience when we first wrote some of our more overt spiritual songs about six years ago, the judgment in my songwriter head was, this is far too on the nose. This is, there's, there's, there's nothing in this. It's too, and, and Devorah, who I was writing with at the time, encouraged me to keep going. And lo and behold, we put them out there and people like them. And I think sometimes the simplicity of, of the poetry can, I don't know whether it unlocks more of the music or it, it invites someone in. I'm not, it, it just creates a different container. I, yeah, it's hard to describe, but I had the same, I had the same judgments you were having. And I'm sure, I think we probably all do at some cultural level. Yes, yes, I think so. But until we embrace it. Until, until we embrace it, because even now, uh, now that I write by myself, it's like, I'm, this, I'm the same person. I just trust myself so much more yeah. than I did then. And what's coming through is extraordinary. It's so good. You know, it's really on point for the time. It's not, and some of the songs are very devout in that I'm writing, uh, but I'm writing into a whole nother field. It's more, more from ancestral, uh, more from the earth. Mm. Uh, and the harmonies and, and ways simple, more simple. That feels so needed right now. The ancestral and the earth energies are really, it's interesting that's been coming through in a lot of the channels the last year or so. Like we need that energy and we need to connect with it more. So I can't wait to hear it because your last album was 2018, I think. Is that right? Yeah. In my own mind, it's time to fly. Yeah. And it was a great record. I, yeah. I love the album. Uh, and now, oh, and we're writing all the time. I'm writing, and now some, and I have singers that we write together, mm. and that they show up and they sing it back to me more than we're writing together. But I did write one with Dorothy James, a, who, a singer, in my Sunday devotional. Uh, but I'm saying a singer, but she's really, um, she's just a great spiritualist. Mm. She's a great person and a great spiritual director, and uh, and she came with a song that came from the ancestral realms, realms, and she knew it was. And when she brought it to me, I listened to it and I just listened to it and tried to have no judgment, you know, just watching. It's kind of like meditation, like you're just kind of watching what's up, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then I clicked into her heart. And when I clicked into her heart, that's when I could support what was coming. Mm. And the song is called Closer and uh, Closer to You. And she's talking about her mother, her father, and the ancestors. And uh, the part, and I, I, I added a piece to it that says, you are the bridge, take me closer, you the bridge. It's so beautiful the way we work this song together. Uh, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And it does speak to that field, to the, to the spirit. Because for me, you know, for years, it was just the Holy Spirit. I was raised Catholic for the most part, and very impressionable years. And it was all about the Virgin Mary and Jesus. More about the Virgin Mary and the saints, <laughs> pretty much, you know what I mean? And though they were speaking about it, the deeper I go into history, I get that the, that the Virgin Mary, the saints, are all, they're, 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 they're repre representing the ancient, more ancient, uh, ways of being in the world. So the first mm. virgin wasn't her, and wasn't Mary, and the first uh, saint wasn't Augustine or Gabriel or any of them, you know. But they're like ancestors. Yeah, they're our ancestors, and that walk is a powerful walk because it's not like 
I know one of my teachers has said a long time ago, she, he said, he said, Every, everybody's not an ancestor. So the ancestor is the one that really dialed in, that really got the juice of life, that really presented and represented this time. And I don't feel like that at all. I don't agree with that. I think they're all ancestors. And I think that they get to heal what was not healed through me. Mm. So in my family, there is this, there was this pattern of the woman that was forgotten, the woman that was a genius, but that wasn't recognized. The woman that maybe bore the children over here, but that's not included in the obituary. Mm. You know? Yeah, completely. You know, you Edited know. out. Yeah. The, or, or the woman that's really bringing the juice in a community, but not really recognized, recognized fully for that capacity. Yeah. So, so, so in me, for me as a woman to stand and to see that in me, what, what's left of that, and to open myself up for more gratitude, more love, and more, more courage to stand and to speak the truth. It's a big deal. And to rewrite what was left out. Hmm. So I can't just know it and feel good about it and watch my daughter know it, but my daughter, she's got questions about that stuff. Hmm. You know, she's got questions. I'm showing her a grandfather and pictures. She's like, she's like, he's a tyrant. That man was a tyrant. He, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a good person because she knew what he did. <laughs> She yeah. knew what he did. He was wealthy, very wealthy, very, very intelligent. He was a physician, very well known, an, extraord an, ex an extraordinary entrepreneur. He had all those things that people work for in the world. Mm -hmm. But those things do not last. I don't care what your last name is and how many billions of dollars you got. Because at the end of the day, even if your family is going to have those billions down the road, that doesn't mean that you, they are producing the kind of people that encourage life and love. You know, you know so my uncle, my, my granddad had money, he had land, he had knowledge, but did he really have love, love? Mm -hmm. Did he have love? And so I, the other night I went into the encyclopedia where his name is and read all the things they had about him and they had, you can submit information here. So I submitted the information and there was a third wife that's not mentioned here who bore six children and their names are all his name. And I have the death certificate of my mom with his name on it. And just when I finished, I was like, wow. I could feel something in the ethers go like, Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Because I, I never knew my grandmother. I never knew any. That's the other thing. I didn't, have, I didn't have. Did you have grandparents, Lee? I did, but I only knew one of them. By the time uh, I came along, there was only one left alive. Yeah, like, like in my family, there were none. And uh, so I had no grandparents and um, or great grandparents that I knew of, but they're still here. Yeah. Like they're still here. All that genius is here. Mm. All that potential is in me. And so now that I'm walking closer with them, uh, a new, a better Ricky is showing up. It's beautiful. And this, so, and this is being poured into a lot of the creation right now. Yes. So we'll do... Can I ask you when you think there might be an album emerging that we could listen to with with some of this or Yeah, well, well right now I'm looking at the way you do an album now because in my Sunday devotionals we call it the B hood and the Sunday devotionals are every Sunday from 10 to 12 um on YouTube youtube.com/rickybyers. But when we do the devotionals, we're doing that music so good that now we're pulling the mixes. Great. And they are incredible. I'm not yeah. surprised having been there because um, that's the thing. If you can if you can get a great live recording, that would be yeah. phenomenal for people. Yeah. But this is in my living room. This is not at Agape. This is in my living room. 
but same, 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 same conduit. Same, same <laughs> conduit. Same <laughs> conduit. Same <laughs> conduit. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and the, so the, the stuff sounds, and so we have these mixes and I'm looking, but at the same time, you know, I got to get, I got to reformat my mind. Cause when I say CD, it means to me that I'm creating this product that's on a disc and people aren't buying CDs mm. like they used to. Mm-hmm. So I have a basement of product and the input and inventory. And that's not like, do I want to create more of that? Or do I just do digital offerings right now where sure. people can get them? Uh, and so, so, but I have it, I have them, I have the music. So we're doing it. We, we, we're, we're about to, come out with something really special in you know the next 90 days perfect well that's great because by the time this show goes out there may be an advanced link for it so we can time it so that we we bring this show out around the time that the new work is coming out because you know it's funny one of the things i was reading about you ricky is that your your songs your chants um and and compositions are, are 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 basically being performed you know, in churches everywhere, you know, on a, on a Sunday, but but there is something magical about having the recordings because then you can reach everybody wherever they are in the world. And I think especially over the last couple of years where people's ability to be in person has been more limited, yes. um, it's always great when you bring out the recording, the blueprint that then people can sing from or learn. Or And I have to ask you, the, the song you were talking about earlier that your daughter... Um, when she was three, having a health crisis, that the only one she wanted to hear. Has she ever covered that, or have you ever covered that together? Or no, I I, I sang it a little while there, and then I stopped singing it there mm. at Agape, because it wasn't. Um, I, I sang it sometimes, but not much. Right. It wasn't one of my favorite songs. I just wondered because she had an affinity with it, and she's a musician. I but maybe yeah, I don't know who. Yeah. You know, she she'll have to find her way to that. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Believe me, if you know my daughter, she, she, <laughs> Georgia does what she wants to do. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> She's known for doing. She, when she hit that stage at the Hollywood Bowl. I was like, oh my god! Only Georgia. And and I said, I said Georgia Grace Jones was proud. She was like, let it be so. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. What's what's her last name? Her last name, Ricky. Well, it's Georgia Ann Muldrow. M U L D R O W. Okay, cool. I'm going to check out her music. Yeah, you love her. Well, one of the things I think so great about you is is your your very conscious activism, and there was something I found that you um that you wrote here you know, that you recognize freedom must exist on both the individual and collective levels. And so you're, you know, very engaged in endeavors that address both. And I think the spiritual path and our own internal journey and healing and hopefully becoming more of who we're here to be is one thing. But you've been very much out there in the world for for, for a long time with your, your activist work. Like one thing that really hit me was you have your soul sisters today, um, which you've been doing for over 22 years. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I love the sound of it. Yeah, well, Soul Sisters is it started out as a women's retreat. It wasn't like a, a monthly women's ministry or uh, at first, but now it's like um, it's a gathering of women. And we'd, we'd meet once a year, uh, and that was awesome. And we'd have about 200 women or more that mm. would show up and... Uh, and I just am really good. I'm good as a facilitator. I'm good because I'm unscripted and I'm channeling what needs to happen. And uh, it was just so awesome. And inside of that, every Saturday morning, we do an, a, a process called Tell Mama. It's Tell Mama All About It. And uh, we bring out a council. We call them the wise women. Uh, the wise women, uh, I would choose the women that were going to be on the council. And it would be about six women, and they were all elders. Mm. And they were the oldest that were there, but they were also wise, you know. So you couldn't just be on the, the council because you were old. You know, you were there because of, because I felt something from you. Yeah. And, the, and they were there. And the young women would come 
with their issues and these women would counsel. So it was like uh, pretty extraordinary because when a, when, a, when a 90 year old says to you and you're a woman and you're going like, I don't know if I can have this baby. I don't know if I can be, a, if I can adopt this child if I'm strong enough. And they go and a, a woman looks at you with that kind of loving wisdom and they go like, what is it in you that thinks they got to be small all the life? <laughs> you know, the way they, the way they spoke to the women, what, you know, was just, and my mom was in the center of that group. So she was, people would come because they wanted to be with Mama Byers or Lissa Sprinkles or LaVeda Campbell. And all these women have passed on. Um, but other women are coming in now to fill those slots. And the last Soul Sisters we did was a virtual retreat, but I actually let a 27-year-old in on the, on the Council of Wise Women, who was amazing. Mm. You know, it was amazing because you don't have to be old to be wise. Mm -mm. You know, I mean, these children and young people, they're, you guys are so dialed in in a powerful way that um, to not include you is a travesty. Well, I, I, you know, I often think that because I've talked to various friends about this and what's going on, the the, the readiness of of young people now versus because I'm 45, mm -hmm. so I feel like my generation was the generation that was just coming into an allowance of emotional awareness, emotional communication, emotional intelligence that really, for say, my parents' generation was denied, eradicated, uh, shrouded in fear. Yes. So, and, and then it's interesting now to see 20-year-olds um, today or 25-year-olds who aren't having to fight for that mm -hmm. because it's it's no longer a fight that, you know, it's kind of, it's more readily available. And sure, not everyone's going to be in that, in the flow of that, but it's there if you want it. Whereas for many of us growing up, that that was something we really had to go and seek you know, we had to actively go and find it to, to heal ourselves and then become an advocate of it in our communities. That's true. And then these younger people than that, than the 25 year olds, I mean, I have a 12 year old grandson that is completely realized. Yeah. He's just so full of love. Mm. When he was in kindergarten, I was like, he don't need to be there. <laughs> he ain't going to fit. <laughs> he had so much love and they had so little time for it. <laughs> and he was there for three weeks and they finally got his parent. They, they finally got him out of there. I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> They'll shut down everything good that's inside of you. <laughs> it's great. a sad thing. It's a sad thing. And so that kind of freedom is what I'm about. Mm -hmm. You know, a freedom to for us to be ourselves. Soul Sisters was about that. It was about just like said it because there was so much of me that was unsure uh, when as a younger woman that when I discovered the, 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 the very powerful good that was here for me when I when and, and it did come and show me I mean I have the kind of incarnation this time where whatever it is I need to know they'll go they'll just go bang you know it's like I don't have to work and work for it I have worked in, in my yearning to be better. But uh, what, they'll go like, you know what? She doesn't have to do, she suffered enough. Mm -hmm. Let's give her a song because she's going to be deliberating about that all through the night. She needs to be resting. So let's give her a melody. Boop! <laughs> and I wake up and there's a melody. And so I go to the piano and there's a great song in the land of I am, you know, or I'm wondering if I can make it through and I start writing and there, there it is. Don't you know that I'm holding you? You know, the spirit is writing through me, deliver me today. In all things, deliver me. Who am I? You might say that I am your integrity. So, you know, the, the, you know it, this, this beyond words that takes me and that is who I am waits for me to just return. And I found the way to do it. And it's just to accept who I am. It's not even hard. It's not hard at all. It, but it's, but you know, they make it hard. 
You know, when we get steps and we get procedures and we get courses and we get all these things, and those things are wonderful uh, for people who need it to look like that. For me, I just needed to learn how to be okay. Well, this is Georgia's turn, my daughter, with having my work be a work in, have my, having my life be a working prog- a work in progress. She says, you're a work in progress. You're learning. You know, you, we came here to learn. So you're learning. It's like, and she said something that was very powerful. She says, and if everything is perfectly done, then where is the space for the un, un, undifferentiated chaos that is in every point of the universe that is in our creativity? that dwells inside of our creativity, the undifferent, the, the undifferentiated chaos. I was like, yes. Mm. I read that sometimes. It was in the New York Times. They did a feature on her. And I'm reading this stuff. I was like, oh, my God. She's right. <laughs> she learned from me. <laughs> Brilliant. But there's a chaos. And we, you know, we want everything to be so orderly, so... If I work five years and I get the job, you know, I get this, I get that. And the universe is so much more than our plans. You know, our plans are colonialized at best. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we can break from that and get free. And something else shows up. What has happened for you that maybe is of significance to share in the last couple of years? Because I think this last couple of years has been such a game changer for so many people in so many ways. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I know you're in a you're in a whole new chapter of your life this last few years. So I'm I'm wondering what what has perhaps a discovery been for you that is either new or a new way of seeing or feeling something that perhaps is different to where you were a few years back? I'm, I'm... Yeah, well, it was happening uh, even before I left Agape. You know, it mm. was something had... <laughs> I did a festival, my first uh, festival. It was called the Rhythm and Joy Festival. And on the opening day, uh, 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 it was a three-day festival. Shaka Khan was there and the Mothers of Invention. I mean, I just had a lot of stuff going on. And... Very diverse festival. It was what I wanted it to be. All these great teachers were there, but um, mostly it was music and and parades and all kinds of stuff. It was just a great idea. But on opening day, winds showed up at 80 miles per hour. You know, and I'm looking out the door and I'm going like, what? All my money. <laughs> we couldn't even put the stage up because the winds were, gro- 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 were blowing so fast, so so much. They eventually did, and the festival went on. But when it was done, everything that was small in me was blown away. Mm. You know, because everything in me was tested. Everything. So many things that were going on, and it was a it was a brilliant festival. The people who made it still speak highly of it. It was in 2013. And I did two more years of festival. And then I said, I won't do them anymore for a while. But that was a breakthrough for me because I realized that you can do almost anything you put your mind to, but what is necessary? What is it that's really calling you? And the the festival is still calling me. Outdoor engagements are still calling me. Having gatherings with real people is still calling me because I think um, it's good to be able to fly images out through the Internet and through Zooms and through YouTube. All those things are great to do, but we need to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to gather. We need to sing together. We need to feel the power of our dance together. And I'm standing for that because I think that's what holds the world together. And it's so simple, you know, and, you know, but we each see the world in terms of who we are. So the scientists might say, like, it's way more than that. It's formulas, it's formulaic conceptions, it's the way things blend and synthesize and blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm going like, well, yeah, but you guys got it kind of messed up right now. So shut up. (laughs) 
I'm sorry. Be quiet. <laughs> It's a it's it's a hodgepodge out there right now for sure. Oh, but I love I love what you're saying because it was so interesting. I, I was channeling for our portal community last month, and one of the things that my guides were saying, they said that we are no different to the trees in that they all connect and communicate with each other, no matter no matter how far. But they have a way of feeling each other, and they were saying, you know, technology is one strand of it, and it's great that we have it. Very similar to you, but that we. What we have lost in the last couple of years is the informational thread between us when we are together in, in person. So you are great and mighty. I, sal- I salute that. I look forward to your, uh, I'm, I'm going to find out when your next gathering is and I would love to be there. Um, Ricky, I know we, we're probably, we have room for maybe a, another few minutes, but um, we're going to put links to all of your work. Um, and for anyone listening, um, go to the show notes, um, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can go to the show notes, but you can find everything that Ricky creates, produces, and is a conduit of at rickybyers.org. Is there anything that you, uh, that's, that's, that's close to your heart right now that you're creating and curating? I mean, we've touched on the album and, but perhaps for 2022, is there a vision or a dream that you, you, you are working on manifesting? There is. I, because in leaving Agape, one thing that I left was the most beautiful sound stage. Mm. Uh, that's what I missed. When I missed Agape, when I left Agape, I didn't necessarily miss all the, the ministries and the different things. I loved the people and um, I loved all the things we got to be together, you know, what we got to do the, together. But there were other things that were happening that were, were feeling too structured for me. Uh, but the sound and light team was were so good. They were, and they were, we were all very, very tight. So I missed them when I left. And uh, so I have good sound, pretty good sound in my living room. We call it, this is my, my studios in my living room, but it's a big living room. Uh, so my living room studio is, is pretty impressive. Uh, I have an engineer that comes and does our sound and brings equipment and what have you. But I want to hear sound in a, in a in a larger way so that sound can do what it does for people mm. you know so i want a center mm. so i see my own retreat grounds where people can come and restore where i can pitch tents and what have you for outdoor festivals or outdoor gatherings uh that so that people can connect because what will save us and well what will serve us is our connection. We need to be connected. Like the plants and the trees, they're talking to each other. And there's a lot of information that we have, you know, just being here with you today, just this loving, this loving presence of yours is bringing something rich to me. So. Mm. Well, it's because you you got my heart several years ago. That's why. So I was, me and my heart were very excited to be with you today. Um, yeah, beautiful. I love that. I love that for you, and I love that for us, because <laughs> hey. of course that will be that will be a house for everybody. So I'm I'm seeing that. I'm feeling that. Uh, yeah. It, so it so it will be. Um, I can't wait to to visit it for the first time. Yes. Thank you. I probably will call it the Raj Ranch. The Rhythm and Joy Ranch, because that was the name of my festival. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Don't you like that? I like that a lot. I think that's yeah. great. I yeah. think that's great. <laughs> Ricky, thank you so much for being with me and with us today. And just thank you for impacting my world and the world the way you have. Um, when you were sharing about, you know, the wise elders that you you would gather. And, you know, first of all, I think probably like many listeners and viewers, I was oh, I want to go to that. But but I also I really salute that in you and that energy that you hold and um, and I'm grateful for it and I'm I'm grateful for you uh, doing your work in the world. I can't wait to hear the next album. And um, for anyone watching or listening, if you get on Ricky's newsletter at rickybyers.org, you will find out about all of these upcoming things. So I hope you have a beautiful rest of your week, Ricky. Well, thank you, thank you, Lee. Take care. You too. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Lee. I'm an intuitive and a channeler, and I've been channeling now for 23 years. And the information and the energy that my guides have underscored my life with throughout those years has been very transformative for me. And for those of you who followed my work over the past 17 years or so, I know for many of you too. As I was visioning and doing a lot of deep diving this summer, really talking to my guides a lot through the month of August, they gave me the name Initiation as the name for a series of messages that they want to bring. Initiation will begin on October the 27th and every Wednesday live from this studio, I'll be channeling for approximately an hour to 75 minutes. I have asked my dear friend and sound healing collaborator Devor Bozik to create some original music encoded with planetary frequencies, but also frequencies that relate to our body that can run underneath each of the channels. And my guide's disease have given us a written message about what initiation will be and what will take place during it. You can find that and all information about this experience on the course page. In between each of the live broadcasts, I will do a special calibration video that helps us at a human level calibrate to and integrate and absorb what each channeled message will be. This is different to anything I've ever done before. I can't wait to bring it to you and neither can my team. If you feel to be with us for initiation or you want to just get a sense of it, please visit the link below this video to learn more and to feel more and to see if it resonates with you. If so, we'd love to have you with us.